Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It's Wednesday, April 19th. Derek Van Riper here with Eno Saris. Uh, programming note, I guess, is that we are flipping days of this episode and the 3 O show, even though they're in different feeds. So the episode we've been doing with Britt midweek is now going on Thursdays on the Athletic Baseball show. So our Thursday Rates and Barrels is now coming out later in the day on Wednesday. So I don't think it changes much for anybody. Uh, <laughs> we were going to record shows together both days anyway. It just kind of changes the timing of things if you listen to both. and Changes the freshness of our content on the 3O show. Makes the 3O much less likely to have stale information. And we really. Oh, we're on quite a run with rates and barrels recording during news moments. <laughs> oh, the, the prospect show, Project Prospect, is, uh, is on a two week heater already with talking about players that, you know, in the case of Mason Miller, I think it was clear he's coming up soon, but we didn't have the news that he was coming up today at the time we were recording. It came out like 20 minutes as we stopped. So uh, we'll start there. Mason Miller is debuting Wednesday for the A's. We talked a lot about him on yesterday's show, and it's a big stuff play. It's just a high risk, high reward from a, a volume perspective and maybe a command perspective as well. You mentioned yesterday that the arsenal might not be that deep. That could be problematic for him as well as he tries to I turn the lineup over a third time. That could be a shortcoming. But the velo was huge in that last start at AAA. I don't know if I brought that up. Several pitches over 100 miles an hour. This is a big-time four-seamer. You mentioned the cutter yesterday. Uh, there's a slider and a changeup. If he can get one of those other pitches working more often, then I think we could see a really productive run for Mason Miller. Yeah, uh, I updated the doc with minor league stuff plus numbers. Wish I had had that yesterday, but uh, number one is a weird name. Luis weird name. Palacios. Mm. Not the name is weird. It's the it's a strange placement. He sits like 90. So strange that he has the best stuff plus in AAA. Um, I wonder what's going on there. He also has an awful location plus, so... That explains his awful numbers. He has pretty awful numbers if you're looking him up right now. So anyway, that's a weird one. Uh, but anyway, after that goes Mason Miller, second. Mike Burrows, third, uh, who's unfortunately on the schneid uh, right now with an injury. But Taj Bradley right there, who's uh, ported that over to the majors. Um, and Simeon Woods Richardson still in the top 10. Grayson Rodriguez. Tanner Bybee has moved into the top 10 with a second start. Uh, Kyle Harrison still in the top 10 and then somebody whose name I do not know Elvin Rodriguez Elvin Rodriguez Elvin hmm. a Ray oh of course <laughs> 16 innings three starts just about eight K's per nine three walks per nine hmm it wouldn't you wouldn't think he'd had top 10 stuff yeah, you know what, though? It's it's a little funny. He has spent time in the Angels organization and the Tigers organization. And, oh, look, it's two organizations that don't get the most out of their players. And now he's a Ray, and now something's clicking. Who <laughs> thought? <laughs> also, a an 11% swing strike rate uh, is better than his K-9. So mm -hmm. uh, there might be something going on there. He's had that swinging strike rate though before, so that that That's is not true. a change from the Rays system. I should put I should put that out there just to be completely fair. Um, but these are the best ratios we've seen from him in this very brief sample at AAA. So an interesting name, just given the injuries that are piling up but of course, on the Mason Rays. Miller is more interesting. Yes. So have you shifted a little bit on on your 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 talent based expectations for Mason Miller, having seen the updated model? Yes, um, I am right now opening the per pitch type so that we can. Uh, oh, how did I do that? Okay, Miller. Let's do Mason Miller. Why? This is good radio. Did you have a weekend on a Tuesday night, you know? I did. I am yeah. foggy, rather groggy. I went to a fish show last night. I'm doing my best. Leave me alone. Doing uh, <laughs> Mason Miller's cutter, 143 stuff plus. Mason Miller's fastball, 140 stuff plus. Mason Miller's slider, 127 stuff plus. And uh, the fourth pitch, where is it? Where is it? 
Let me see. Come on. If memory serves me right, he didn't throw the fourth pitch more than once or twice. Once. Yeah. <laughs> Change up 77 stuff plus. I, I don't know. I think what do you think fastball fastball cutter slider? It's a righty with a four seam fastball, uh, a cutter and a slider. It could work, I guess. Well there's not a lot of people like that, but the cutters should should be good against lefties. I talked to him last night at the game before <laughs> the show. Uh and uh he talked about uh the cutter is new. The cutter is new, so he was really fastball slider with the occasional change of before. I mean, Mr. Fastball Slider right now is probably Spencer Strider. And I thought it was interesting that Lance Brozdowski, who's getting like daily yeah. mentions on our show, he said maybe this, this could is, be this, this could year's be Strider. Strider. I thought of it more because of just how quickly he was going to move and how few innings we saw him throw in the minors. But from an Arsenal perspective, the, the comp actually holds up even better than just by a, a path sort of concept, which is what I was stuck on before. So, I, I mean, I, I don't want to... I never want to expect any guy to come in and do as well as Spencer Strider did last year, even if the two main pitches are very similar. I would mm. suspect the stuff numbers on Strider's two pitches are not that much greater than what we're talking about with Mason Miller. I think they, I think they have real concerns, innings and wins. Yeah. The, the, uh, the A's are on a pace to give the fewest wins to their starters in the history of baseball. <laughs> They're just so good right now. <laughs> That's the word. <laughs> so, and then he had what twenty eight innings in the minor leagues. How how far are they going to push him? Hmm. Okay, this is an exercise we've had before. How far back into a player's past when they've lost a ton of time to injury are you willing to go to set your number for a workload? And do you think that's what the A's are actually doing? If you go back to College for Mason Miller. Where are you to, getting these numbers? This is from Baseball Reference. He pitched at Waynesburg, by the way. <laughs> D3. Wow. The heaviest workload in a season that I can find for Mason Miller would have been his... The, actually, the end of his college career was at Gardner-Webb, if this is right. So it's about 100 innings, 98 and two-thirds in 2021. He got a handful of innings... With the A's, that was the year he was drafted. Yep. Okay. A so bunch of injuries and and two two years ago. So if ninety eight and a third innings was the high from and since years he's ago. He's thrown what thirty innings. Yeah. Can you use that as the previous workload and just say, all right, the target is one twenty five or one thirty? Is that fair? No. That's what I would do. Uh, yeah. Okay. I guess. As far as a ceiling, like hundred. Like, like where would they stop him? I think best 100. case scenario, hundred probably more real, like a more reasonable expectation. Yeah, hundred. Yeah, that's pretty useful. It's super useful though because you might get them it's all now, really and then you can ratios. solve it later. Yeah. yeah, especially because of the park. All right, so top fifty starting pitcher in that group or outside of that group? In that group. In that group, okay. I don't know why I'm, uh, uh, yeah, I'm dragging my feet on some of these guys that the stuff plus likes, but <laughs> you have to consider other things too sometimes. All right, inside the top fifty means you could pick him up basically everywhere. They've said regardless of how this first start goes, he's going to stay in the rotation. The debut comes Wednesday against the Cubs. It will likely happen before many people get to hear this podcast. So uh, we're putting all this out there, sight unseen. But I'm with you. I think top 50 is a reasonable expectation based on the pure arsenal, the stuff that Mason Miller has. And even with that workload restriction, he can do a lot of good for us, given how difficult it is to pick up pitching, especially in deeper leagues. Other prospects up. Brian Rocchio gets the call to Cleveland. And the more I look at Rocchio, you know, the more I think he's one of those guys that he can do a little bit of everything. But because he's a glove and hit tool first player, He's probably a better real-life player for the Guardians than he is a fantasy player. And those skill sets oftentimes get stuck as AL-only, NL-only type players who 
kind of bounce on and off your roster in mixed leagues if they don't develop something extra. Maybe it's a little speed, maybe it's a little power, maybe it's a little bit of everything where he's a 10-10 a guy or a 15-15 guy at some point. But I'm not as excited about Rokio as I was about any of the shortstops we discussed yesterday. Like Zach Neto, by comparison, I actually think has a much higher fantasy ceiling than Brian Rokio does. Plus, there's a little bit of a uh, complicating factor with the playing time because Ahmed Rosario's hurt right now. And yeah, the it, corresponding move is is Rosario. So that's the other so thing. This might be a short term corresponding move thing. test more than anything for me because I do like the uh, the 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 contact, and uh, he might get there in slightly different ways. But I do think he can be an Ahmed Rosario type player. Um, so he's a decent uh, replacement for people that have Rosario, uh, mm. but I wouldn't uh, go that hard into him. Uh, because of it i mean the projections are one thing 250 basically uh with less than league average power uh but even if he hits like he hit in the minor leagues uh it's like a 280 i think 15 15 type package like you're saying now because the age to level has been very favorable there could be one more level of development for rokio but it just... might happen over time in the big leagues you know right could be a year three, year four sort of thing where suddenly there's more power. That's yeah. the way I could see this playing out. So I'm not going crazy trying to pick him up everywhere, but he is on the radar, especially if Rosario ends up on the aisle. I think at the time of this recording, they had not made that decision just yet, but that would be the thing that would open up a lot more playing time. Uh, the Reds have extended Hunter Green. And I think with Hunter Green, he, he was... He was someone you definitely liked coming into the season. I think a lot of people were, were into Green as a breakout pitcher this year. It's a six-year, $53 million contract extension. as a club option for a seventh year. I think this takes out uh, two years of free agency for Green. So the Reds get their cost certainty. This is a nice start to the season so far in terms of skills. A 24-6 to six strikeout to walk ratio and just one home run allowed through four starts. Only 17 innings so far for Hunter Green, but... I think we're seeing the signs of that big step forward from him. And now we've got the, this extension that keeps him likely in Cincinnati for the rest of this decade. Yeah, stuff tells the same story as K-BB. And this is a guy that if someone dropped on your on your wire, you should pick him up. It's pretty pretty easy to see. I mean, tons of strikeouts, 31%. I mean, doesn't that, that's got to be uh, one of the league leaders. Yeah. Yeah. Strikeout rate leaders among starters, Spencer Strider, Jacob deGrom, Joe Ryan, Chris Sale. The stuff does not back that up. Pablo Lopez, Shohei Otani, Garrett Cole, Logan Gilbert, Hunter Green, Nick Lodolo. So looks pretty good. Looks pretty good to me. I, I, I think it's a great deal. It's uh, the one thing is you can you're more assured to get a great deal for me on these at least team friendly uh, deals with hitters you know injury could lead to a lot of different outcomes but still at 50 million dollars uh even if he misses a year due to tommy john or something he's going to be great yeah hunter green has a ceiling that returns the value of the entire deal in one year if he reaches it like that's yeah. actually a possibility for him with the talent that he brings so the easy, why would you do it if you're the Reds? Why would you take on a little bit of risk? That's the reason. Hunter Green, of course, getting those those guaranteed dollars, wanted to make that commitment the other way. And I think in the case of the Reds, it's clear that the young talent is there. It's just not on the roster yet in full. It's going to be another year or two before you start to see all the prospects they traded for joining Green and Nick Lodolo on this roster and, and making things a lot more exciting uh, in Cincinnati. We did see another start from Taj Bradley, you know, and it happened to be against the Reds and the Rays. It's, it's, we started recording to the Rays were just pummeling the Reds early on. It was a, a debut from Levi Stout, one of the, I don't know, less hyped prospects that the Reds acquired in all those deals. He came back to them in the uh, Luis Castillo trade, but uh, the Rays on fire. Taj Bradley looking like he's going to have a, a longer stay in this rotation, though, because we finally have a little more information on Jeffrey Springs. It looks like he's going to have Tommy John surgery. That was based on a report from Mark Topkin that came out on Tuesday. So that was with a that, wild ride, man. That that <laughs> day, it was like, oh, you know, they announced that he's got a, a, a sprain. 
And you're like, well, that's not good. That's a ligament. That's going to be a month or two. And then they're like, well, they changed their announcement. It's a strain and a strain is muscles. And you're like, oh, he could be back in two weeks if it's a grade one strain. And then literally like a half hour later, Tommy John. Yeah, brutal. <laughs> it was a wild up and down roller coaster. Uh, but yeah, it's unfortunate for Springs, unfortunate for the Rays, but uh, fortunate for Bradley. I do think, uh, I do think he's in the rotation for good. Like, w why not? I have no reason if I'm them to take him out. You just I mean, let him pitch. Even when Glass now is healthy, uh, you know, without Bradley, you're doing the Fleming opener thing. You know, yeah. Even when Glass now and Eflin are healthy, you're doing the Fleming opener thing. So I think Bradley is uh, better than the, the Fleming opener thing, um, and that's when Glass now and Eflin are healthy at the same time, and that means also Shane McClanahan, Drew Rasmus are all healthy, and that seems like it's going to be a tough thing for the Rays this year. They're just going to kind of cycle through guys. So when Bradley's healthy, he's in. Couple things here with Bradley. I think if you're in a league that allows trading it's a good time to go and reach out to whoever picked up Taj Bradley and try to get a pitcher from them because they may be plus one on the starting pitching side. Mm. Perhaps it's an injury. Don't ask for Taj Bradley. <laughs> don't, ask, don't ask for Bradley. We'll get to yeah. that in just a second. But yeah. there's a positive, like look at that roster, see if there's one extra starter that's good enough to start on your team that's not necessarily starting on that person's team right now. I would definitely look at that. The second thing is, where does Taj Bradley rank for you rest of season? I'm looking back at your late March ranks. And Jeffrey Springs was at 36. Drew Rasmussen was at 29. I think he's, he put Bradley right in there. He just, he just takes over one of those pitcher. spots. Yeah. I think he's a top 30 pitcher. Uh, right now, uh, overall stuff plus with no minimums. Uh, DeGrom, Otani, Green, Strider, Bradley, Ashcraft, Rasmussen, uh, May, Burns, and Cole. So there is not a single person in that top 10 where you say, what is going on there? <laughs> and so you can kind of assume that Bradley belongs in that group. I mean, it's all fire and, and bluster and, and nastiness in that top 10. So uh, Bradley, absolutely. I, I went pretty hard on him, as I said, in my main uh, just thinking that he would get the opportunity to run with it. And because of the minor league stuff, numbers are so good. And, um, you know, I, I paid a fair amount, $326. It's probably maybe the most I've ever played on a single player. But uh, we feel pretty good about having Bradley in our rotation now. We got yeah. Bradley and Grayson Rodriguez. It's heavy stuff plus play on our, on our main squad. You've got some ceiling. Yeah. So the Bradley Arsenal so far, it's been close to 50% four-seam usage. That pitch has been excellent for him so far, averaging 95.8 with that. The cutter is actually his second pitch. There's your four-seamer cutter combo. It's 28.6% right. usage on that. Throws that at about 87.7. But Stuff Plus loves his changeup, which is... His, his changeup, he's only thrown 12% of the time so far, and he's got a curveball that he's actually thrown almost 10% of the time. So those other pitches do get a bit more usage from Taj Bradley already. And you wonder, as he gets uh, multiple looks at some teams over the course of the season if that mix might even change a little bit where he goes to those secondaries a bit more often. It's a split. It's a split, a gyro slider, and a huge curveball. The curveball uh, stuff plus says it's average, but it looks nice. I mean, it's minus 10. It's a, it's a real big curveball. Um, and so, you know, I think it's a, I think it's a package that'll work. It has uh, strengths. Look, this is funny. It looks good, but the curveball has already allowed a homer. Um, you know, and has a three seven five blood batting average. So uh, maybe he replaces some of those curves with split fingers, which uh, Stuff Plus loves, and has a you know one twenty five ISO. So I think this is uh, all systems go, and yeah, he's a top thirty pitcher. All right, so we just added two guys up into the top thirty and top fifty range between Taj Bradley and Mason Miller, so I think we should take a couple guys out, at least one who's still healthy. Springs, of course, by injury, unfortunately, falls out of that group, but Alec Manoa, you expressed concerns about him last week. I was a little more on the side of, let's see some more. I think I'm, I'm going to hold off on, on being concerned. Does Manoa fall that far? Is he no longer a top 50 starter? If you're re-racking the rankings for today, does he end up 
somewhere closer to geez, the Tyler Malley, Jamison Tyon range, the guys that were just on the outside looking in at the top 50? I mean, this is an easy one for me. You're asking me to take somebody out of the top 30, and I had him 30th. So. <laughs> yes, he can drop out of the top 30. Uh, he had poor stuff numbers last year. Uh, he was projected to have 100 stuff plus this year, and he's had 95. It's not one of the biggest losers in stuff plus. It, it It's a combination of losing a little bit of stuff and maybe just what the projection systems and what the models saw, uh, which was not the greatest stuff. So, yeah, that's an easy drop for me. I think I would drop Manoa um, maybe to the, gosh, yeah, I think to, yeah, low 50s. Uh, you know, once I start where Chris Bassett was going into the season, you know, uh, where Kyle Bradish was, I, you know, would would I take I, would I take Bradish over Manoa right now? <laughs> let me let me check the. You're thinking about it, yeah, yeah, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> I'm obviously been the high guy on Bradish, um, and uh, his stuff is uh, pretty good. 93 uh, stuff plus on the fastball, Bradish, and then a 137 on the slider and 122 on the curveball. I think he's pushed that fastball to to the point where. You know, an 88 on the sinker. I think that's good enough uh, for him to succeed. So, yeah, right there. Bradish versus Manoa, I guess. The Manoa thing, I mean, the projections back during draft season, I remember seeing, I think it was Steamer and the Bat both had the ERA north of four. Yes, the Bat was 421, Steamer 427. The Whip, 124 from the Bat, 128 from Steamer. And those were the worst projections. Even the, the best projections, I think Zips was the most favorable, the highest on Manoa, was 371 for the ERA, 113 for the whip. That was easily worse than what he had done in his big league experience. It was it was projecting a drop-off for a guy that was really young. I mean, Manoa just turned 25 years old in January, and I just I had a hard time with that. It broke my brain. I think the only thing that kept me from having Manoa on, I don't think I have him on any teams this year, is where he was going. It was just right. in a pocket of the draft board where I like some of the hitters that were going. Was, I was dabbling was in first closers, like, like an ace, or ace light, you know, like back end ace. And uh, if I wanted two aces, I wanted one ace more in the top ten. And uh, if I wanted two, I would get them, you know, earlier. And so once I got, you know, my ace or quote or my two aces, I didn't feel like I needed to jump back in where he was. So um, the 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 projections have actually changed some. So uh, the most uh happy about him going forward is zips with that 371 one, one, one uh 371 era 113 whip that you mentioned but preseason zips was also uh the high guy and preseason that was a 343 three era and a 107 whip that's a pretty big move after 19 innings yeah so he's already lost a third of an, a run of era and now uh basically three of the five systems on fan graphs have been projected for over a four ERA. I don't know. There's also uh, the run environment this year is higher. So maybe I'm being too harsh on him. A four ERA might still be useful in a lot of leagues. Maybe, he's a, to, maybe he's a top 50 guy. We talked about Ricky Tiedemann on the show yesterday. And when you look at this Jays rotation, it's been a bumpy start to the year for Chris Bassett. His last turn was better. Manoa has underperformed, at least so far. Barrios doesn't look like he's going to be fixed. Kikuchi looks good for now, but we've seen this movie enough times to, mm-hmm. to know that that's not necessarily something you're going to expect for the next five months. And I wonder, for as good as this Jays team is, like how vulnerable they could be with this rotation. Because part of the Jays getting back to the postseason and being a dangerous team in October was having a one-two punch with Gossman and Manoa, two guys that you could trust to go out there and just flat out win you a game. Even if it was a, a matchup where your own bats went quiet, those two guys could pitch well enough and do that. I mean, it's it's not in my nature to look at a guy after four starts and just say, nope, it's not coming back. There could be an adjustment there. There could mm-hmm. be a mechanical tweak. Who knows? Like, There's any number of things that could happen. It's weird to me that he's walking as many guys as he is so far. That's been a huge problem. The home run rate's through the roof. The hard contact rate, not surprising that the home run rate being up, is also up. I just wonder if it's if it's actually fixable with Manoa, right? If what we've seen so weird. far is His slider is earned. reading his average right now, and the slider was always thought of as a, as a real strong point for him. 
Yeah. And that's, that's the strange thing is that it's, you know, that's, that's through the model. <laughs> that's, yeah. that, that's a, that's a problem with something he's doing with the pitch. That's yeah. not a results based analysis on him. So that's where I think the, the added concern that that was the Wait. best pitch before. And it's not, it's just kind of average. Yeah. That's a huge problem for a guy that didn't you have something like similar arsenal. with Barrios who used to, you know, look good in the model. Cause he had like a one forty stuff plus on the curveball. It's at one Oh five now. So basically, this model is saying he's a league average breaking ball and a league average changeup and, uh, you know, slightly below league average fastballs. It just reads as league average um, for Barrios. So I think there's some real problems here. And that's why I went on the radio in Toronto and, you know, I, they pushed me to a hot take. And my hot take was uh, Ricky Tiedemann will be the second best uh, starting pitcher for the Toronto Blue Jays this year. Yeah, that could salvage things if that's true, and he's he's healthy enough to pitch deep into the season. You know, if you but go Dawson Tiedemann instead, yeah, they could... move Barrios to the pen, or somebody just gets injured and they give him a chance. Mm. There's a possibility that somebody is injured. <laughs> yep. I mean, just looking at these stuff numbers, you're like, you're like, well, are you guys healthy? <laughs> <clears throat> I have a, another guy I want to ask you about. Because I, I caught some of the Nats Orioles game on Tuesday night, and it was a Josiah Gray Dean Kramer matchup. Not necessarily a pitching matchup I was tuning in for, but I think I was looking for. <laughs> I think it was actually DFS purposes. Yeah, I had Jamer Candelario in a lineup, so I wanted to see if if Jamer could uh, hit an early home run for me before better games came on. And I was watching Josiah Gray, and they they threw the the pitch mix up on the screen on the Masson broadcast. Oh, the Masson Cup. That's what that that's what that matchup should be called. The Masson Cup. Mm-hmm. Josiah Gray is throwing the slider more than anything else. He's going slider and curveball at 37% and 24%. And then the four-seamer, the cutter, and the sinker with the occasionally literally thrown two change-ups. So he's throwing his two breaking balls as his most heavily used pitches. And I'm wondering, as, as someone who was previously kind of out on Josiah Gray, in part because the Nats don't usually bring a whole lot to the table as far as making pitchers better, did Josiah Gray do enough sort of taking his future into his own hands, as you put it in the past? And did he change himself in a way where you could actually trust him as a more viable starter with this approach? No. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I I think the move to the cutter and away from the four seam is good. Uh, That's the thing the model likes. That's the thing the results like. And it is something that he has changed this year and it has made him a better pitcher. However, the model says that uh, the cutter is his best pitch and it's league average. Um, and I think the results uh, agree. There's a 276 uh, batting average on the curveball. Uh, there's a 167 ISO on the slider. Like That doesn't sound high, but you're not supposed to have that much of a slugging on your slider. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's 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 a pitch that usually has like you you look and you're like oh this guy's allowing a 200 slugging on this slider you know <laughs> um, and he's allowing a 389 so um, and that goes with a dead zone a dead zone is fastball I think the the real problem with Josiah Gray is he does not uh, extend he has poor extension I think it's bottom quartile extension maybe even bottom of the ex- extension so he's a little bit like. Um, Oh man, who's the Tyson? Ross. Tyson Ross, yeah, yeah. Tyson Ross had a really short uh, delivery, and it just always plays worse than the eye test because we see it from behind the plate, and so you're like, that looks like a good breaking ball. That looks like a good fastball. It's 95 or whatever, you know. And then, uh, but behind the plate, when you're at the plate, behind the plate, you you start to see that you can just see it longer. You can see it longer, and uh, it, that reduces the effectiveness of everything. Yeah, just to your point, look, I look at the extension column pretty often when I'm looking at pitch mixes on Baseball Savant. It's all the way over on the right side. It's a bunch of 5.7s and 5.9s. Usually, you don't see numbers less than 6. Yeah, it's just, that's it's unusual. Six, yeah. it's, it's improved, too, from last year. He was at 5.6 five, and 5.5 five, and 5.4 five, on his yeah, four-seamer slider and curve. in the league last year in this series. Not Almost the worst. Days, but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> huh. That's uh, that's disappointing to uh, to say the least. I was just intrigued by how much the pitch mix had actually changed. 
I think with this new pitch mix, he's uh, he's he can leap into sort of uh, streamer status for me because he is going to get some he's going to get some matchups where it's going to be all right, you know. Um, but a seventy nine overall stuff plus is uh, really poor. And just to put it in context, Patrick Corbin has a seventy nine overall stuff plus. Uh, so the Nats have a type. <laughs> Actually, Trevor Williams has a 79 stuff plus. So, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> the 79 club. It's really weird, actually, because the other two starters in the rotation, Mackenzie Gore and Chad Cool, both have 94 stuff plus. <laughs> they only have two numbers. <laughs> if you're a stuffist, Mike Rizzo, anti stuffist. Yeah, that, right. <laughs> very, very clear based on what they've got cooking there. Uh, let's talk about Mike Soroka for a moment. I saw that he pitched very well in his most recent outing at AAA Gwinnett, struck out five over six scoreless innings, only had a couple of walks, scattered four hits. It's been a really rough road for Soroka coming off of uh, the Achilles injuries, you know, two Achilles tears. That could be a career-ending situation right there. He's still just 25 years old. Bryce Elder's pitching fine for now, but when Soroka first broke into the league, even though it wasn't, it wasn't a profile that was going to lead us to a ton of strikeouts. I thought he was a bit of a a rich man's Kyle Hendricks in some ways. From a here, the ratios are going to be good. The K rate's going to be a little bit low, but because the team context is good, it's going to work really well from a roto perspective. If the volume is there, innings wise, Mike Soroka is going to exceed expectations, even if projections are a little bit wrong about him year over year over year. He's finally healthy again. I'm curious, once he's back, and we don't have any word these rejoining the rotation just yet, once he's back, are you in on Mike Soroka after all these injuries? Yeah, yeah, I I think so. And maybe even a little bit more than the model says because, um, you know, he right now has a 101 stuff plus in the minors. Um, he's hanging out with uh, sort of between Forrest Whitley Riley Thompson, DL Hall, and uh, Logan Allen has fallen a little bit in his previous in his in his uh, next starts. So um, he has league average stuff plus maybe, but that's better than Elder Dodd and Schuster. So yep. I think he's gonna he's gonna get the role. So I think the 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 time is there that he's gonna he's gonna pitch. He's gonna be in the rotation if he's healthy. Uh, and he seems like he's healthy. And then two, I think, you know, the model struggles most on changeups and uh, and sinkers. Um, and, uh, you know, he has a good slider. Um, and, you know, he has, the model says a 92 stuff plus on the sinker. But he really commands the sinker well, you know. And I, that's not showing up in his location plus numbers. And maybe that's what they're waiting on to, to activate him is to, to, to get that command back. But he's a guy who can really command the sinker and then has weapons to get whiffs too. So I think, I think, uh, I think stuff and uh, strikeout rate models uh, undervalue him a little bit. And I would take the under on his uh, four one five ERA projections from most models. I'd like, um, I like him a little bit where the bat has a 379 ERA and a 1 2 whip. I think he could do that. Won't be a big strikeout rate guy, but I think he will be a run suppression guy. Yeah, and probably a wins machine in that Atlanta rotation, too. Uh, speaking of extension, though, my goodness, looking back at what he was doing before he got hurt, this is even less extension than Josiah Gray. Wow. Five fours, five threes, even some five twos back in 2019. That's. That is the least amount of extension I've seen on a Statcast page so far. New I record. Where it is right now. Yeah, yeah, that'd be a good bit of information to, to have. Yeah. Hmm. Well, we'll have to wait and see. Wait, wait till he comes back, probably to have that question answered. I but just one... better, better movement profiles, even given the poor extension. Yeah, and that makes a Thin pretty, gray. pretty big difference. Yeah. And one more question. This is an NL East related question, or pitching question, that is. Is it actually happening for AJ Puck right now in Miami? Are we trusting this? Is this the arrival of a new possible top 10 closer? We're always looking for new closers to join this, especially younger guys that could do it for a handful of years and and be the uh, uh the port in the storm, if you will, and maybe be a 25 or, or 30 save 
uh, source on a regular basis. Are you buying into what Puck is doing for the Marlins? Yeah, I am. I am. And I think he can be that, that closer. Um, he, you know, Tanner Scott has the best stuff plus in that pen, but we don't have to look at his location plus, which is poor. Just watch know. him. You'll see it. <laughs> yeah, just watch you him. Know. You'll see it, right? <laughs> that Tanner Scott probably has too poor command to be a closer. It's just, you just, you just can't, like, you don't trust that, you know? You don't right. Don't if it were the scouting advice. scale, it's, it's 80 stuff with 30 command. Yeah, it really is. And so Puck uh, right now is reading uh, a little bit lesser in terms of stuff, uh, but he's superior in terms of, of location plus. Um, it is interesting. He throws a a sweeper uh, and he's a lefty and sweepers have big platoon splits. Hmm. Um, but uh, and, and, you know, as a lefty, you'd be like, "Ooh, that's that's a that could be a problem. Um, but he does have two really good fastballs, and the, the model doesn't love the change, but um, it, it could be uh, big for him. He has that sort of starter's mentality, um, and so I think that he will overperform his stuff and be a good closer. Yeah, I think he's, I don't know if he's a top 10 closer. Uh, you know, there's some uh, context there in terms of how bad the team is. Uh, is this bullpen good enough to, to continue to de deliver safe chances to him? Um, you know, there's some questions there. If someone offered you AJ Puck for the shares of Ryan Presley that I know you don't have, would you would you take Puck? No. You mean like in a keeper league or something? No, the redraft league. Is Presley hurt? He's got zero saves. No, I'm taking Presley. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> K rates <laughs> down. Yeah, it's you, an easy you know, one for me. Home run rates up. I don't know. I don't know. I I I'm I'm, I'm I'm Mr. Ryan Presley. I'm the, I'm the guy that, that really always has Ryan Presley on my teams. I'm just just trying oh, to find a, a common look ground. Look at that. His, his stuff plus and his fastball fell beneath uh, 100. On I thought he was going to do more with that changeup after he showed that that pitch in the postseason. I thought that was going to be a, a bigger part stuff of plus likes it, but he's still he's still a two breaking ball guy, and you know I think he still has enough velo to to be the closer there. I I still take Presley over Puck. Uh, they've bumped up that slider usage again for Ryan Presley. He has thrown the change up a bit more this year than he did last year uh, with that loss of Velo on the fastball. Almost almost down a full tick so far. So trying to make adjustments, probably going to be okay. But you're not quite there with A.J. Puck as a top 10 closer, even if you are a believer. A solid like closer two, probably, from that, that mm -hmm. next group is where we'd go if we were uh, re-ranking and redrafting today for the rest of the season. One position player question that's been on my mind for the last 24 hours or so. Is Jake Berger an actual better hitter than Yohan Mankata at this point? Defensively, there's a problem. Berger needs work defensively. Mankata's a good defender at third base. So that's where the White Sox might run into some difficulty once Mankata is healthy. But I think I'd like Jake Berger's bat, even though he strikes out a lot. No. Further supporting evidence. Further Mikata supporting evidence is better. What are you talking about? You Further evidence. Would you rather today? This is not a no. This is not. We're going back to 2021. Since 2021, Mankata's played 257 games. He's played like four times as many games. No, really? he's hit 28 homers. What are you gonna struck out 26 percent of the time? Has a 244, 333, 393 line over the last two seasons and few weeks right so it's a 104 wrc plus <clears throat> jake berger is more of an up and down guy 259 315 517 it's a 130 wrc oh, plus that's painful for me to hear these numbers and i wonder if they gave berger more time if he could lower the k rate a little bit yeah he certainly had way lower the strikeout rates in the minors but also higher whiff rates than you'd expect given those strikeout rates so he's always had the whiff Barrel rates over this time, Mankata, 8.8%, oh Berger, 17.5%. You know, Jake Berger might be good. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Are you prepared to live in a world where Jake Berger is good and takes Yon know, Mankata's job? No, that's the part I'm not, I don't think is going to happen. Like, he's going to take, they're going to let Mankata go when his contract is up. But Mankata is going gonna, gonna to play, I think, when he's healthy. I think one of the problems for Jake Berger is <laughs> Eloy Jimenez's defense and injury history. Because if they would 
if they could play Aloy in left field, and then Berger could DH. Right, Berger now. could DH more, and then he'd have some time there. The other path, I guess, would be Vaughn playing Andrew Vaughn, Vaughn less. Yeah, or or just playing playing Vaughn less. But Vaughn's two fifty eight, three seventy eight power hasn't been there so far. Three seventy one for the slug. I don't know. Maybe I'm I'm just I'm wish casting more playing time for Jake Berger than he's likely to get. But I will give you that Jake Berger is good. That I will give you. He's a good I don't hitter. Think he's taking yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's a good qualification. <laughs> he's a good hitter, and I just don't. I think I don't think he's taking Moncada's job. I think defense is a part of that reason too. It matters for sure. I think that's what complicates things for the White Sox. But I, it says a lot about I think where Moncada's current offensive level really is compared to where it briefly peaked back in twenty nineteen. So I don't know. That's uh, that that is one really surprised buy me. Low for you? Keeper in dynasty leagues for I, sure. I like that pull percentage inching up. I want him to pull the ball more. And pull percentage inching up, the walk rate going up, the chase rate going down. Like there's a lot of good stuff in here. His max EB has always been good, so it's about tapping into his raw power. Yep. And I know the bail rate is down, but it's not in a significant sample yet. Is Vaughn a member of the um Previously named Nathaniel Lowe, lift the ball more club. Yeah, lift the ball, pull pull fly balls. This guy needs to pull fly balls. I don't know why he doesn't pull fly balls. Someone should tell him to pull fly balls. <laughs> Someone's telling him. It's, it seems like it's hard. Yeah, that, that is. But <laughs> but that pull percentage inching up says to me that maybe he's inching that contact rate out in front of the plate a little bit. So, so my reasons for buying in, though, the plate skills are really good right now he's walking more than ever he's, he's kept the k rate team. down yeah he's he's good enough offensively to play the hard hit rate's still there he's hitting the ball hard even though he's not hitting it in the air and pulling it in the air yeah that to me is still correctable you're talking about someone with 1100 big league plate appearances i would say that you're at the point in the in the year where if you're in a keeper league or a dynasty league you're starting to identify the slow starting players that are younger guys that could still get a lot better and if you have to start playing for the future, even if you're not, if you're just trying to get better in the short term, you want to take a few chances on younger players that can help you down the road. Andrew Vaughn fits that description. Like there's still a very good chance we have not seen his best season. And there's enough core, there are enough core skills there to go ahead and buy in now while you can. Price will still be low and the payoff could be significant. Yeah. Agree. So I'm in I'm in that phase for a, at least the one keeper league I've mentioned in the show, the XFL league, where I've had just a rash of injuries. Ryan Bloomfield and I have the uh, the injury bug in a bad way in that league. So we'll be we'll be eyeing up players like Vaughn in the next few weeks and probably making some moves. A bunch of great mailbag questions here. You know, the first one is a, a really important one to keep in mind if you're just looking up players on Savant and Fangraphs. This question came from Chris, and Chris just wants to know what's the difference between the hard hit rate on fan graphs and the uh, hard hit rate you see on baseball savant. Uh, and the, I mean, the numbers are really different. Baseball savant, 54.3%. That puts Juan Soto in the 91st percentile. Yeah. From, from fan graphs, the, the calculation, uh, it is a calculation. So it's not video scouts making decisions on the hard hit rate on fan graphs. It is a calculation um, done by Baseball Info Solutions. But the calculation I includes uh, hang time, location, and general trajectory. So I believe that it's a little bit more barrel-esque, right? Mm. Where um, general trajectory sounds like there's a basically launch angle in it on some level, right? Yeah. So uh, if there's launch angle in there, then it's more uh, almost like a quality of contact metric than a hard hit rate. If that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think it, it, so. it's a more precise form of barrel rate. And is that the way you'd, you'd describe it? I don't know. It, it, the exact algorithm is not available to us. Right. Um, but... Yeah, I don't. It could be more valuable than just straight up hard hit rate. It could be because it does have some quality of contact information in it. 
in terms of good angles. In that case, if you look at this year, 26.1%, compared to last year when it was a down year for Soto at 29.4, do you have some concerns at this point that we're seeing a little more of the same, that we're not seeing the elite of the elite player that Soto had been for his first four seasons in the league? I've been concerned with him. The The top-end ISOs have disappeared with the, the, the ball, and so he's more of a kind of 200, 220 ISO guy since we've had this new ball in play. And that's because he's a bit of a let it travel guy um, that uh, goes oppo and he's really lost the oppo homer. So now his pull rate is up uh, and his barrel rate is up. Second best he's ever had. I think those are quality things. Um and uh, yet he's had the biggest ground ball rate of his career. So he's pulling ground balls and uh, something has got to change for him. I think he's just in an adjustment period is how I put it. He's not, you know, I know that some people read it as com- as sort of whining or, uh, you know, trying to absolve himself of blame, but he is reportedly having trouble with the pitch clock. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, He's got the pitch clock thing. He may be eyeing the shift and, you know, thinking he'd become more of a pull hitter. And I think there's just an adjustment period in there. I'm not ready to write him off. Yeah, we are seeing more pull balls than ever from Soda up to 37%. That could be good. Yeah. Yeah, if he's going to hit the ball in the air and pull it, good things are going to happen. And the barrel rate, 17.4% here early on. I wouldn't be panicking if I had him. I would love to trade for him if I had someone willing to trade him to me. I just don't know if the people that have Juan Soto on their teams are are actually all that worried. If you are worried, I don't think you should be. I think he's he such a number one bat in our main. I think. Yeah, we're we're actually a little bit more worried about uh, Masataka Yoshida, mm. uh, who I'm not fully sure that uh, he is a buy low because uh he has an extreme ground ball rate and like he was he had a high pitch in the high in the high in the zone that I was watching the other day and he hit a grounder on it so he has this like real kind of ground ball heavy approach so I'm worried about these projected isos and he doesn't have much speed, so even if he gets it going in terms of that is a really great, great strikeout rate, and he does have a, a really good eye and really good contact rates, but even if he gets it going in terms of batting average and hits 280 from here on out, I'm not, I don't know, what the, I might set the over-under on homers around 12 or 10. Yeah, all the projection systems are still above that for power right now, and they're even a little high on average, which is, you know, thinking about the part of our conversation about Manoa and how quickly his ratios have changed, I would have thought that even 13 games in the big leagues would be impactful for a guy whose previous inputs were all based on you know another league. Yeah, they haven't moved much. I mean, the, the ISOs are moving down. That is, that's where the biggest impact has been on his projections. Yeah, he's if, kind of like a 180 ISO by most systems going in, and now he's 160 to 170. Yeah, Yoshida, a player that I have on zero teams, so I wasn't even oh, uh, aware of necessarily of just, just how bad this is. I the strikeout rate. I kind of fell in love with the strikeout rate and thought, you know, at least we'd have a, another Stephen Kwan, but Kwan lifts the ball a little more than this. I mean, 67% ground ball rate from Yoshida. He's got to, he's got to fix that. I wonder what his ground ball rate was in Japan. Yeah, and then I wonder how relevant that really is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> does that even matter? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is uh, a weird thing. Uh, you know, better pitchers are harder to lift. Here's one for you, the two related to Yoshida. Did the performance in the WBC convince you? Like, were you already interested before that, or did that kind of like if you were on the fence, did that say make you say, yeah, this this works. This it guy's did, good. It did help make the decision for me. Because there were, there were things to like, like. He's he's doing he's doing this against elite competition. Like he's hitting homers too. So it's like in doubles. So I thought he can lift the ball. He has power. Yeah. Thank you for the question, but Chris. You have to think. You know, there is actually pretty inconsistent quality of opposition in the WBC. It is not unlike spring training, and I wouldn't necessarily look at the spring training slugging numbers. So. Yeah, bad process for me on that one if, if that really made my decisions. 
Well, it's it's early, but yeah, you've you've got some reasons to be concerned, and we've got plenty of time to see if those reasons will you know, be fully validated. Uh, we've got a question from loyal listener OJ, and it was inspired by Caleb Ort. And I don't think Caleb Ort has ever inspired a question on our podcast before. He's a a 32 year old reliever in Boston. And the question is, how should actual teams on our fantasy teams balance the subsurface numbers against opportunity costs of not rostering younger guys with upside? So it's like a guy like Caleb Ort popping in a pitching model versus someone much younger. Uh, in the case of the Red Sox, it'd be someone like Thad Ward or uh, Noah Song, who they lost to, uh, off the 40 man. They've had a few other guys that have, have been kind of removed as a result of of uh, protecting these older guys that that pop. So how do you balance that from a real life and from a fantasy perspective? If you have uh, someone on the wrong side of 30 that just jumps off the page, but you have other guys that are in their mid-20s who maybe don't pop in the model, but have more growth potential that they could untap. And they might even have mm. the, the benefits for a major league team of being inexpensive or being optionable, where someone like Ort you know, eventually is out of those options because they're so much further along in their career. That last bit is is really important. If you build a bullpen where you don't have at least two or three optional guys, I think that you're you're going to be in trouble over the course of a season. Uh, you just want to have the ability to rest a guy without putting him on the IL. Basically, that's what those options are. And uh, so he does. If you have too many of them, yeah, you can you can affect your balance and then have. Uh, what you end up doing is boxing yourself into a corner where you have to release somebody, you know, if you don't have enough options in the bullpen. Uh, and that happens to teams every year, right? There's always, there's always like this carousel and somehow the Rays always end up with the good reliever at the end of it. Uh, so uh, it is something that you have to consider, but uh, I'm also a little bit like, uh, what are you doing for me now in the bullpen? I don't think that I want to spend too much time thinking about future bullpens. <laughs> you know what I mean, like I do want to spend some time. I want to think about it. I want to, I want to have optional guys next year that, you know, that are good. Um, but in terms of like, am I going to think this guy is going to help me in the bullpen four years from now? I think that's pretty unlikely. Yeah. Bullpens definitely seem like they're built for, now and not for later and i think or actually does have options left ryan brazier though is another good example of someone that uh, does not have those options also the results are bad but the model likes them yeah so like how long do you trust that when you're looking at someone who's in this case 35 i mean caleb ort's 31 i could kind of talk myself into a few uh a few reasons to believe that he could get better and and still be pretty good whereas brazier you're like okay this dude's probably at the very end of his career yeah, yeah, and it's interesting that is um, that the model likes him. I, I need I need to get that. Hold on, why why does it like him? <laughs> I need to figure that one out real quick. Hold on, pitch modeling stuff. Once upon a time, Ryan Brazier had one really good pitch that led him onto a bunch of my right. rosters. I think that's probably still the case. Must be I want to really say. Slider. Yeah, I thought it was a, a slider that he could get a ton of whiffs with. I think that was what brought him to my teams a few years back uh weird it's a sinker that's very odd that's surprising and not a good slider um maybe that's why he's having trouble uh getting whiffs the slider gets pitch is a sinker but the slider gets great results like year over year over year ball rates this is this is a weird pitcher (laughs) gets gets whiffs though gets whiffs and guys don't do much with it yeah Hmm. Yeah, so you you stick around for a little bit, but you're right. Like he's out of options. He's not under contract uh, next year, and uh, you know if he's not helping now, and and like a 104 stuff plus is actually kind of borderline for for a reliever. You know, how long do you stick around with a 104 stuff plus when the average reliever has like a 102 stuff plus and the results aren't there? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like if he's popping 120s, then you're like, well, we're gonna wait a little bit longer. Like Caleb Bort has a 127 stuff plus. You definitely hold on to him before, and he has an option, right? You you release Brazier before you release Ort. Yeah, and I think if if you put me in the chair of making the actual decision and you say, well, use the Red Sox example, I would have much rather kept one of those younger guys they lost from the 40 man than kept Brazier because the Red Sox are trying to do that thing where they. 
they spend some money and they hang around and they kind of play the middle. If you're going to play the middle, you should skew to the younger side of the decisions for your pitching. You want more controllable guys as opposed to the 35 year old that might help you in the seventh inning. Like that's just that, to me, that was bad process. But Who'd they lose? I think it was Thad Ward, Noah Song, and Franklin German. Yeah, and I know some people on teams that like Franklin German. So, right. So at least at least one of those guys probably made sense more than than Brazier. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, although I can see the, the process maybe being like, well, he has good stuff in our model. He can help us this year. Thanks a lot for that question. OJ, we've got one more question. This one comes from Angelo. Angelo wants to know if we have any concerns about Luis Castillo. He's pointing to a drop in uh, Stuff Plus to begin the season, which, I don't know, I, I think, first off, I mean, Castillo's pitching really well through four starts. I know it, those are different things, looking at process versus results, mm. but seeing that the, the fastball velocity is still good, you know, the slider and changeup are both still there, as viable secondaries, I would assume that uh, Castillo will also gain some ticks on the fastball. It's well, he's just... shown us this this multi year pattern of yeah. of struggling or not having his best stuff early. The cold weather does seem to have some kind of impact on him. Or earlier in the year, he's just not as as and sharp his stuff as he plus is. Would also go up if he threw his slider more, which I think he'll do over the course of the season. This is a it was an eye opening thing. I, I I stood in for my. Uh, you know, semi-annual uh, Max Scherzer yelling at Eno Saris about Stuff Plus uh, <laughs> session last week. And uh, one of the things that, that that Scherzer brought up was that the best pitchers think about the season as a full season. Hmm. You're going to see the Astros again. You know, you're going to see this, this team again. You're going to see the A's again. And so, you know, we had Chris Bassett telling us, well, I don't want to show everybody all my pitches in the first inning. Um, then what do I do in the, in the fifth, you know? Um, and I think that there's some players that even say, well, I'm going to have April me and I'm going to have September me and, uh, they're going to be a little bit different. So his stuff plus would go up right now. If he threw fewer fastballs, forcing fastballs, he's at the, uh, uh, six year high or seven year high in fastball rate. If he threw fewer of those, his stuff plus would go up, but, Maybe he's made the calculation. I'll throw quarter. I'll throw twenty five percent sliders later in the season, you know. Uh, but right now, I'm going to try and get back by on the fastball. So we would see fewer fastballs with more velo. I think his stuff plus will actually kind of go up to meet his production. And the other thing is, uh, the longer your track record, the better your K minus BB. Uh, the more I will ignore the stuff plus, especially with starters. Yeah, for me too. The other the other thing that I really um, I think is interesting with Castillo is it, when you have a fastball that averages ninety six or ninety seven, and you lose a tick or two. I mean, he's sitting at ninety five one with his fastball. I'm not worried about Luis Castillo only throwing his fastball at ninety five one. You can afford there is to a lose bit of a that. shelf there. No, yeah. there's a bit of a shelf there. I think it could be more. It would be more of a problem if he didn't have good secondaries. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like if he was a uh, Spencer Strider and he went from 97 to 95, I would be worried because uh, there's. I think the shelf now is around 96. So it's moved up. I, I used to think it was like closer 94, to 94, but now the average is 94, so it can't beat yeah. the 94 shelf. You know? Hmm. Yeah, does the model still like the changeup for Castillo? I mean, when he came into the league, that pitch was unbelievable. He's throwing it a lot less now than he did years ago. But he prefers a slider, and you know that's been the change that the Mariners did was make him more of a four seam slider guy that can go to the sinker and change. But to me, there's two Luis Castillos, and so since there's two Luis Castillos, uh, I think that's a good thing. Do you know what I mean? Like he, he, if if the slider, if he's got bad slider command one day, or or he's hitting a bunch of lefties or, or or a righty team, like he he has two different ways to be, and I think that's good. Yeah, I I would agree. I think he's much more it, with his arsenal, much more balanced in the different ways he can attack. Even though the the pitches aren't thrown equally, he can just come up with a different game plan, and that does make it easier to just go through a lineup. You think about seeing the Astros a bunch of times, and and how are you going to deal with them at the beginning of the season? How are you going to deal with them at the end of the season? I think it's a really good point that Scherzer brought up to you. Is just that you it's it's playing chess. It's having a plan that's going to work not only today, but that's going to work 
two months from now and three months from now and in the postseason. And so um, I always prefer pitchers with more pitches. Yeah, no, that's that's built in. That's like the built in insurance to have uh, more in the tank later on thanks a lot for that question angelo uh, we are going to head out on our way out the door a reminder that you can get a subscription to the athletic for one dollar a month for the first year at the athletic.com slash rates and barrels you can find Eno on twitter at Eno saris you can find me at Derek van riper if you got a question for a future episode rates and barrels at gmail.com is the best way to get that to us uh, if you were watching our last video and my voice stopped with like 10 minutes left in the show uh, I fixed that so you can <laughs> listen to the end of the episode on YouTube. It was fine on the podcast version. I have no idea what button I clicked or if I leaned on the keyboard or something. I have Blame no idea. the baby. I, I probably was the baby's fault. I worked <laughs> on it. Went to go help with the baby, button mash something, getting up from my desk and clipped off 10 minutes of audio. So That's my apologies funny. for the technical difficulties because I didn't realize it happened. Someone asked, they said, am I just, uh, the mushrooms kick in or did the DVR's <laughs> voice just cut out? And I, I tweeted back, I'm like, probably the mushrooms. Yeah, Looked at it later, I was like, ooh, <laughs> <laughs> producer error. So my apologies for that. But yeah, hit us up on Twitter, at Eno Saris. I'm at Derek and Ryper. That's going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. We are back with you on Friday. Thanks for listening.